Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Eric Sweden here. Uh, Craig uh, Orgeron, Dr. Orgeron, cannot make this call. You get pulled at the last minute. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Now, we're not going to run this like a normal webinar. Uh, we are going to put up a slide deck with most of these slides up into our library. Uh, and some notes that go with this. And we'll certainly keep track of all the Q&A. And Mark has agreed to answer any questions uh, that come in after this. We'll, st we'll start a uh, thread on our community on this topic. But we're testing this to see what the level of interest is uh, across this community. But we're very fortunate to have Mark Jones here uh, from CAST Software, but also from CISC. And he's going to explain the, that dual role in a minute. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, Mark has got background uh, for some time, uh, many years, as a active speaker, panelist, contributor for organizations around the concept of IT software standards, open source risk issues, agile governance, IT acquisition, governance, and cyber uh, security. So uh, well qualified, well experienced. For the last four years, Mark has volunteered as the public sector director of the Consortium for IT Software Quality, or CISC, C-I-S-Q, which is an industry leadership group comprised of government and industry IT executives, system integrators, service providers, software technology vendors who are all committed to introducing a computable standard for measuring software risk and size for IT application quality to reduce cost, risk that can be leveraged in service level agreements and internal IT policy. Mark currently leads CAST's North American public sector, including state, federal, uh, government dedicated uh, system integrators and consultancies. He manages key strategic global and national commercial accounts and has held various field and leadership roles across North America with a focus on enterprise IT application risk governance. Mark specializes in supporting corporate and government CIOs, chief financial officers, and uh, others uh, across North America. Mark, we're very fortunate to have you here and uh, welcome. We are glad that uh, you're here and we're glad that you're opening up this topic for us. So I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh uh, Eric, and, and thank you, Eric, Danielle, and Dr. Orgeron for uh, sponsoring and supporting this, uh, this meeting today. Uh, yes, so today we're, we are going to talk about uh, a topic that may be um, uh, a little bit uh, off the standard track for the folks on the call today, uh, uh, but I think as we step through it, uh, it becomes more and more obvious uh, uh, as in terms of the kind of benefits and value of starting to uh, focus on the software stack a bit more closely from an enterprise perspective. Um, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, I wear a couple of hats, and I'll be presenting from both, uh, both, from both perspectives today uh, in terms of the, the work that we're doing with CISC in regards to uh, software standards and policy uh, to date at the federal level, but uh, uh, starting to impact uh, state government level as well, and I'll share, share some of that. Uh, as well. So um, let's go ahead and, and uh, get started here. So you know, why we're here today, as I, as I look at some of the materials and the outbriefs from the, the NASIO uh, working groups, uh, one of the most interesting things I saw was the alignment with the IT procurement uh, organizations and, and interfacing and being kind of more effective in, in communicating uh, the kind of requirements that are very specific to IT uh, with the acquisition folks, and and in fact, uh, one of the recommendations coming out of the of the NASIO work group and working with the IT procurement folks, uh, uh, NASPO, uh, is to leverage enterprise architecture for improved IT procurement, but really to start looking at architecture and standards-based acquisitions. And the kind of conversation we're going to have today is going to be focused on standards that are non-functional in nature. So these are. Uh, really focusing on uh, the illities that impact uh, software security, software sustainment, uh, software, software operational readiness uh, uh, for all the software that's kind of coming into the states from a variety of sources. And if the topic of software standards seems a bit dry, uh, I think what's, what's uh, important is to think about how 
those topics map to the kinds of priorities that the folks on the call have submitted as priorities through NASIO. Uh, when we look at issues of cybersecurity or modernization or talent and talent improvement, standards play a role uh, in all those attributes. Uh, for instance, uh, in the cybersecurity space, uh, the vast majority of the money being spent to secure IT organizations is spent around the perimeter. Yet, uh, many of the vulnerabilities that exist are actually within the IT systems themselves. A common approach from a cyber perspective is to look for the software defects that are purely security and patch those. But the reality is that most of the vulnerabilities are actually in the architecture uh, of the application itself and would map more to, top that, to what we consider to be traditional code quality or software quality issues. Uh, when we think about modernization and the kind of lift uh, to uh, determine how, which applications should be modernized uh, as we modernize them to make certain that the new software being brought into the state ecosystem is, is sustainable and robust and secure. Uh, this wave of modernization uh, is really setting the legacy for tomorrow and deserves to be benchmarked uh, uh, very closely. Um, we actually have uh, worked with uh, uh, one state uh, where the leveraging the standards actually was used to promote and grow and improve the, the state workforce that had been writing the software on some of these systems for 20 or 30 years. And the notion of, of common best practices that are standards-based was something that uh, uh, was not equally distributed across the IT development team. And I'm hoping, Eric, we can get uh, that state to, to come in and present uh, down the road. Uh, from an IT acquisition perspective, uh, non-functional aspects of software are very rarely referenced uh, in uh, an IT acquisition requirement. And that needs to change. I think that is one call to action in this call today. And I'll present some examples uh, primarily in the federal space, but I think they're quite relevant for the conversation at the state level. And, and lastly, as you start to move assets into the cloud, uh, those assets may end up scaling uh, or may end up uh, being exposed to a broader audience, especially if you're looking to leverage a common platform uh, in assessing and benchmarking that software asset to make certain that it is portable uh, and it is secure, uh, and it is uh, scalable, uh, robust, is, is quite important. So we're going we're gonna to address each of these topics. So let's talk a bit about uh, CISC and, uh, and the software standards that uh, we'll be um, uh, discussing in more detail today. Um, so CISC is a nonprofit, and in fact is a nonprofit member of NASIO. So uh, CISC, I think, will become more involved, in, and, and I think you'll have an opportunity to hear from CISC leadership, uh, technical leadership down the road. Uh, CISC is a consortia that is funded with uh, commercial sponsors, and uh, the current uh, sponsors include CGI, Synopsys, Booz Allen, Cognizant, CAS Software, but past sponsors have included uh, Accenture, IBM Global Services, uh, uh, and others. And there's a fair amount of government support uh, in CISC. Uh, it is coming through two of the federally funded research and development corporations, uh, FFRDCs for short, so MITRE being a, a, a principal one, uh, but also the Software Engineering Institute uh, as, through Carnegie Mellon. Uh, both of them are, are extremely involved uh, in, in CISC and in fact provide a lot of the, the technical stewardship uh, of the organization. And the objective of CISC ultimately is to create standards that can be uh, automated uh, and, re and measured re repeatedly over time. So the, the idea here is to have a short, impactful list uh, around a series of abilities that then the market, the commercial tools market, companies like Cast Software, uh, who I represent, uh, but you see Synopsys on the list as well, um, and they have uh, solutions as well that support CISC and uh, uh, can then write uh, measurements that organizations like yours can then start to use to track, trend, and monitor the state of your software assets. So CISC quality and sizing standards uh, are approved for public sector use at the federal level, and we'll come back to that in a few moments. But it's not just a government thing, and I think that's very important because as you work in a multi-vendor environment, uh, you're going to be dealing with some software that's being written in-house, some software that's being procured through third parties that might be completely uh, 
uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, software that you might be integrating into custom stacks. You might be bringing in, in fact, you are bringing in open source software. And in many cases, you're assembling uh, all those different things uh, into one deliverable. The, the important aspect here is that both the buy side and the sell side of the software ecosystem are involved in CISC. And the reason that they can be in many respects is that the objective of CISC is to conform to international standards that can be leveraged by uh, organizations that are writing software anywhere globally. So the blue areas that you see in this ISO 25000 chart around software product quality, reliability, performance efficiency, security, and maintainability are aspects that are uh, currently in the CISC standard. Uh, looking at uh, compatibility and portability is the next wave of the standard, and that's really start thinking a lot more in terms of the mobile endpoints, uh, Internet of Things, uh, and, and more componentized, distributed kind of development where those types of issues uh, really come into play. A funny thing happened on the way to the standards meeting. Uh, when CISC was formed and the first meetings were at the Software Engineering Institute in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, a follow-on set of meetings in Frankfurt to deal with NATO and some support from the EU, and then a last round of meetings in Bangalore where so much of the, the, the software on the planet Earth is written uh, was a real requirement to provide some sizing standards as well. And we'll come into some detail on the, what that's all about here in a few minutes. The next standard out of CISC uh, is going to be a technical debt standard. And I think technical debt is something that's quite relevant to the conversations that I've heard uh, at the last NASIO meeting as we start talking about uh, modernization and challenges. So what is technical debt, and, uh, and why should your state care uh, about technical debt? Uh, well, technical debt is a great metaphor for uh, putting some kind of an economic value uh, and an economic metaphor uh, on software risk. And the notion here is that uh, a technical debt is the decision, the, the trade-off cost of a decision you make to get software in-house and deployed that you're putting off uh, to another day. And typically, uh, these can uh, uh, revolve around uh, uh, maybe not totally investing in security now to make sure you get the functional stuff working, and we'll secure it later. Um, uh, it could be uh, any, any type of shortcut that's taken to get the software out. The principle uh, that it can, makes that debt occur is uh, just the, the, the cost of remediating it uh, in, in present dollars, let's say. The interest is on the cost of, to, of time, so the cost of, that can impact your organization, and one of the major costs, we'll come to this in, in the next slide, is sustainment cost, resource usage. Uh, and then you really start to come into what the liability cost, and that's a risk factor, and that can be uh, exploitable software, outages, breaches, you know, things of that nature. And the metaphor is good because it's a great way to talk to the, the financial side of the house to sort of explain uh, why something should be addressed now versus later and have a good basis for that, for that argument. The technical debt impacts productivity, and it's a real challenge uh, in, in public sector. Uh, government can't move as quickly as industry, so in many cases, you have to live, we have to live with that technical debt longer than many commercial organizations might have to live with it. Uh, it's not unusual, uh, as I travel, to see systems that were written 30 or 40 years ago, especially in a lot of the COBOL systems. and. In fact, uh, I think for folks at the last NASIO conference in Austin, uh, that topic was made clear in one of the mainframe uh, breakout sessions where folks were talking about some of the age of the systems that they have. Now, the issue here in technical debt is that as you, every, as you uh, continue to maintain the software and add new things and not address what exists in the past, uh, your cost of sustainment continues to grow. I hear many times from CIOs that they're uh, fed up with the cost of sustainment of software and that that, that sustainment budget can eat 90%, 95% of the spend available for applications in-house. Well, one way to start chipping away at that number is to start paying off that debt. Another aspect is to use that debt as a decision point in making decisions about applications in your portfolio. 
you may have a build versus buy versus modify or modernize versus kill kind of decisions in-house. And you want to, when you down select the systems, you're down to your short list. One important thing to do is to do an assessment of that system and get a sense for how modern, modernizable it really is. You know, is this uh, uh, a system that you can go forward with? And I think it's an important decision that uh, often is not made at the code level. And it's not made with standards. So it becomes very difficult to have a pragmatic conversation because uh, applications have many stakeholders. Often the funding for them might come from different parts of a legislature or federal agencies or what have you. And you need a standard-based conversation to kind of push that forward. So let's shift gears a little bit and maybe trickle down a bit from what we're seeing in federal and, and come back to the states. So, uh, in 2013, uh, Congress uh, directed in the National Defense Authorization Act that all DOD components uh, must evaluate their software. And they specified that the software should be evaluated to be secure, uh, it should be assurable, and they should validate the quality uh, of, of, that, of those code bases. And, and the following year, uh, they designated uh, uh, an organization through the NSA to do a research on different software applications that can be used you know, to help automate that process. Um, this is still going on. And one of the challenges in this legislation, frankly, is that they didn't define uh, any of the words that are in bold. They didn't define what is secure. And they didn't define what is quality and what is assurable. And this really speaks to uh, why there's been uh, so much support uh, for CISC uh, coming out of the uh, Department of Defense because they're trying to define these kinds of words. The good news is, you know, four, five, six years later, now you have uh, a lot of that work that can be leveraged at the state level. Um, here's a couple of examples, and there, there are eye charts. I get it, but I, I wanted to make sure we had some artifacts here um, from, uh, from, the, from the Marine Corps and from uh, a pretty large component of business IT software within the U.S. Army. Uh, where they have put very specific software code quality requirements as policy on their program managers. And this is an important step in the process. And it's one reason why I think it's important for the, the NACIO constituents to be aware uh, of these kinds of programs. Um, for this to be successful, uh, it needs executive sponsorship. And where I see standards effectively used uh, to change outcomes, uh, is when you have folks at the CIO level, uh, or higher in some cases, uh, mandating the policy that all systems, whether they're internally developed, whether they're outsourced, uh, whether you're bringing in open source solutions and integrating them, uh, whether you're running them on the cloud, running them on-prem, what have you. And even for uh, the, the, the commercial software, I'm thinking more in terms of inter business enterprise COTS, it's a fair question to ask those vendors what their own uh, you know, software quality processes are. And when these policies are put in place, uh, then they're very leverageable and can start to be used uh, by acquisition organizations. So I share with you on screen here two current examples uh, in July RFPs. Again, this is at the federal level. Uh, but I think it's important to, to show precedence for these things so we can transform the way government IT buys and manages software acquisition. One uh, is from the GSA itself, and it is making a reference. So this is a 10-year BPA uh, within GSA for all their real estate and building holdings and all the systems that support that. And what they're saying is that they're going to reference the Consortium for IT Software Quality, CISC standards for guidance on how to measure, evaluate, and improve software. And you'll notice they break out uh, the four categories that we discussed, and they're talking about the fact that they want to see that but they're not going to trust folks. They are going to verify that, that those components are being met. Uh, another example just below that is from State Department. It's an $800 million multi-year acquisition tied to counselor, soft, counselor software modernization. And here also, um, they will be employing uh, a software code quality program to be looking at the security and performance and robustness uh, of the systems. And notice they're really focusing on maintainability as well. One of the things that we see a lot in government is that the folks that write the software uh, are quite often not the same organizations contractually that will maintain them. So we're two different colors of money. 
And uh, once the new development is done, that asset gets flipped over to another company that needs or another, maybe an internal organization that then bears the full responsibility of operating and modernizing that software. And in many cases, that software is full of technical debt. Why is that? Well, it's because projects tend to focus on cost and schedule and functional requirements. So to get as much of that functional stuff done on time and as close to cost as possible, uh, I can assure you we see a lot of systems that have had a lot of shortcuts taken uh, in terms of the non-functional attributes that can come back and really get you in sustainment. So uh, these organizations, just a couple of examples in current RFPs. Now, this is at the federal level, but if we take it to the state level, in Texas, House Bill 3275, uh, which is a policy that goes into effect uh, January 1st, 2018, uh, what you see here are requirements coming out of the, the, the Texas House specifically looking for quality being added to the schedule, cost, and scope conversation around projects. And, to have a, uh, and they're defining uh, the framework for actually evaluating that. And this is not for huge programs. Uh, this will be a program that's going to be looking at anything over a million dollars, any program that's greater than one year in effort, and any program that goes across more than one agency. Um, I would imagine that that's most of the IT programs on, on record uh, within the state. Uh, I think this is pretty interesting uh, to take into account, but also I think it's important if, if this is a topic that's uh, of, of interest to your state to be able to point to some legislation that is in place now uh, that takes that into account. Um, I'm hoping, uh, Eric, we might be able to get uh, some of the uh, folks from CISC uh, that were involved in some of those conversations with the state in terms of what that definition of quality means, and that might be worth a, a brief down the road. Okay, so let's think in terms of what it is that needs to be measured, because uh, there's lots of things out there. If you leave this call and go speak with your technical lead uh, and say, you know, we should be looking at our software code, there's a very good chance that in your software supply chain, uh, some of that code is being looked at. Uh, but the focus uh, that CISC has on what is being looked at is maybe somewhat different than what a developer's focus or even a contractor's focus might be in their own processes. When you deploy uh, a, a system, you're really deploying a combination of many different software assets. And I will posit that as a state CIO or someone in the state CIO's office, you are the system integrator of final uh, uh, the, of the final phase of that software, what you deploy in your network is quite possibly a truly unique one-off that doesn't exist in an exact form like it anywhere else uh, in IT. These systems are very complicated. They're built of many different frameworks, open source components of varying um, um, uh, pro uh, pro uh, provenance, um, uh, and they're integrated in, and often with some uh, uh, custom or commercial solutions that are where you don't have access to the code at all. You're linking to APIs. So when we think about this, uh, we think about breaking that up into sort of three different areas. There's a code or unit level view of quality, which is what the developer sees. It's very much looking at a file at a point in time. And one would hope that they have code checkers that they use. Uh, there are uh, some, some uh, standards and languages for specific uh, uh, technologies. Um, uh, SAP community has standards for ABAP um, that they maintain, and there are things out there to look at ABAP quality. Uh, but what happens when you plug that ABAP system into a Java uh, and JavaScript web environment? Uh, there's nothing out there that really kind of takes a look at that architecture, and I think that's a big part of this work group is to think in terms of complexity of architecture. The research behind that uh, is, is damning. Uh, you have a, a, a situation where most of the code defects that show up numerically happen at the unit or code level, yet the ones that are exploitable um, and the ones that uh, can cause outages and the ones that are very expensive to fix, typically 90% of them uh, are actually at the system level. And I don't think it's any surprise to the folks in the call, you know, I think when you look at where things break in your deployments, they typically break where one thing is trying to communicate with another. Uh, where the web piece is trying to link into that COBOL mainframe back end, where the tax data is stored, 
uh, where it's trying to interface with uh, HHS, uh, CMS, uh, pro uh, provide code base, uh, uh, what have you. So the notion is to provide some standards that are more architecturally focused, and that's where CISC focuses. So if, if you take a look at the CISC standards or you bring those in, they're not going to replace uh, Java coding standards, C++ coding standards, Oracle PL SQL coding standards, uh, or what have you. Uh, they are not at that level of detail. They're really focused on looking at those attributes that would require the attention, frankly, of the CIO or the accountable executive for that system. One thing to point out here is that integration testing is sort of what you use to identify these problems. And finding something in testing is very expensive. So if you can identify uh, where those integration issues are in the code uh, prior to actually putting all that in test, that's important. And I'll add that the Agile folks will say, well, you know, we have a solution for that now. We have continuous testing. We're doing all this as part of the continuous process. But the reality is that typically the code moving through those Agile DevOps environments right now are not the whole code stack that make up your system. It's the Java code or the JavaScript code or maybe the iOS code for the mobile app. But the COBOL code, the database code, is often not being run through those same processes. That's being integrated later. So that's the kind of stuff you want to make certain that you check. When we see uh, organizations that have maturity uh, in evaluating in, in multi-source environments, they tend to have uh, strong central leadership in regards to establishing that standard and policy. And they tend, as part of their own internal program review, similar to what the Texas law is saying should be done, uh, making some regular uh, uh, deliverable uh, to the executive office as part of a program status review that focuses one item on the non-functional aspect of the software. That's a mouthful. It's basically saying, as part of a program readiness review, as part of a program status conversation, don't just focus on the functional attributes, the cost and the schedule, all very important, but also make certain that you understand the non-functional attributes uh, of that software as well. Because if you see those indicators going down while everything's going up, uh, you have a system that has a lot of technical debt and will have a lot of risk in sustainment and operation. Um, we at CAST uh, have a platform that folks use to evaluate complex systems. Um, I put some logos on the screen. I think a number of those folks are in the NASIO ecosystem uh, that actually have capability in-house. Um, it's fair to ask your providers what they're using if they're actually using that capability on your contract. Uh, it's a great way to start. And, uh, and I think as you do that with uh, your vendor community and you collaborate with them and you, you build that, that, that process, uh, it can also be applied in, to your internal organization as well. So I mentioned something about a sizing standard. Uh, earlier in the call. And uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing, and it may not be obvious uh, you know, in an EA conversation at first blush. But in an effort to uh, normalize kind of what you're getting and at a quality level, you also need to understand how much you have and how much you're getting at, uh, at, you know, at, at some kind of uh, uh, common sizing. And this is an interesting slide. It's uh, uh, from a, a Forrester brief talking about, well, how do Agile folks measure size now? And uh, the, the majority of them use, of the projects use story points. And story points are, are perfectly fine um, for uh, codifying a, a, a functional requirement and then putting the, 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 the software design piece behind it. Um, you might also uh, uh, use t-shirt sizes, which is, uh, looks extremely vague to me, but over half the shops are using t-shirt sizing for their apps. Uh, you can think in terms of user stories. Um, a lot of the parametric modeling uh, world thinks in terms of hours of work, but that's not uh, in Agile. That's very difficult to break down. Uh, features, uh, function points, not used very much, and I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, lines of code, I think a lot of the Kokomo models and things that nature that folks use in estimation use lines of code as the basis, but in Agile, folks don't tend to. Uh, it's very clear, of course, uh, attending the last couple of NASIO conferences that states are really trying to move towards Agile acquisition and, and Agile development, and that makes complete sense. Um, you want to see 
Uh, more incremental stuff coming in, not waiting for big bang programs, and you can mitigate the risk to do that. Um, but the challenge here is, well, what is, what is the common standard for determining how much or how big the code coming in is? And I will say that when we, uh, when we Royal We, when, when CISC began, uh, before I volunteered in the first uh, meetings, this notion of sizing was very important. And a bit of context on that, because maybe it's not as obvious to the state and federal space as it, as it is to the commercial sector. In industry, uh, if, an or, if, a, if a Fortune 500 organization is going to outsource sustainment of a portfolio of applications, and I do see some states doing that kind of outsourcing today, uh, one of the core bases of sizing that asset to be able to get a fixed cost sustainment contract uh, is using function points. And, uh, and there's a very mature process out there for sizing software at function points. There's the International Function Point Users Group. There's some fantastic companies with fu certified counters that help define that. Um, what is the issue is that as you start getting into an agile environment, or you try to do this at scale, or you try to size things in more fiscally constrained environments like government, uh, having a manual count uh, process uh, and being able to run this repeatedly becomes a challenge. So the idea is, well, what can we do to automate that sizing? And we talk about automating function points. It's very much the same thing as using, um, uh, at a high level, you know, uh, using square feet for a house, right? So. You know if you've got a 2,500 square foot house, there's already a lot of assumptions you can make around sustainment cost uh, in that house. Uh, but one of the, uh, the effort about baselining that sustainment cost, because you know how many people can support how many function points, and you can allocate those costs you know, over time, and you can compare one commercial offer with another using the same common sizing metric. But a challenge occurs in maintenance itself when you take code and you want to modernize it, um, uh, you know, take, take this use case in a house. Uh, let's say that uh, you have two rooms, you want to knock the wall out and expand it into a kitchen. Well, you don't really add uh, very many square feet just by removing walls that are already there, uh, but you may still pay many thousands of dollars to have that work done. So enhancement points are a way uh, to sum the work of removing, you know, so rework, right? Think of that in software terms, removing code and actually rewarding, being able to reward folks for removing code or removing complexity from code, uh, and, uh, but also making certain that's very clear that they uh, are rewarded for the work that they did. So imagine that you, you actually have a, an incentive. You want to be able to measure it, but you, if you have a house that you take from 2,000 feet to 1,500 square feet, the assumption is the value goes down. But in the software, if it does the same thing, the value actually goes up. And you want to be able to reward folks for being able to do that. So, that this, this notion of automated sizing uh, is quite relevant. So we at CAST, uh, shifting hats a bit here, uh, uh, have been committed to the CISC standard since its inception. And uh, we are supporting a number of government agencies and supporting a, a, a growing number of states um, and in, in evaluating this. And as you can see, we have the ability to score uh, uh, the different attributes, the robustness, efficiency, security. And we can do that across uh, a portfolio of systems or across one very uh, complex critical system. And uh, the way that we do that is by being able to analyze all the different languages that would make up a system. So uh, I, that code stack we showed earlier uh, might be made up of 12 or 13 different languages. Uh, we've seen more than that in systems. And, uh, and CAS can analyze e any of those languages, but also then be able to look at the integrated uh, connections and risk between all the different modules and components of those languages. And uh, we uh, conform to standards, and we have a variety of outputs. I'm not going to get into huge detail on the CAST piece here per se, but I had to explain a little bit about what we do so you can start thinking about how you might be able to use uh, the output. So this is a, a scorecard where uh, one organization has taken the sizing data, so function point data, and also cor started correlating that to quality. And um, uh, you know, I, I saw at the last NASIO uh, event uh, a pretty, uh, pretty packed room talking about 
uh, the notion of having dashboards and being able to quantify uh, of just how much software you have and what the kind of risks are and being able to sort of integrate uh, all of those types of data points. So what CISC brings to that conversation is the ability to bring in, uh, you know, how many, uh, how good is what you're getting at how much. And that becomes interesting, uh, especially when you start thinking about the diversity of the ecosystem of where you're bringing your software in, right? So uh, you have uh, every state has its own sort of state champions. Maybe some small businesses uh, that are close to the state that are writing software for them, but you're also working with the global system integrator community, right? The CGIs, the Accentures, and folks like that. Uh, you're also maybe have in-house teams. Um, you might have some legacy teams, and you might have some teams that are focused on web development, and you might be trying to move one set to the other. We see that a lot. Uh, well, how do you compare uh, what you're getting from all these sources? And how do you compare how much it costs you to get functionality for your state you know, from these different sources? And uh, one way to do that is to have a dashboard you know, that can tell you, well, for this piece of functionality I'm paying, uh, for this common unit of functionality I'm paying $600, a hypothetical number. And I'm getting that number, uh, and at that price, I'm getting quality at this level. And that allows you to make some trade-offs, because you might go cheaper on systems that are less risk, but you might go higher on systems that are more risk, and you can really provide uh, a lot of detail for your acquisition folks to sort of compare uh, different, uh, different organizations uh, and, and agencies and, and whatnot to determine the quality and the risk of the output. Now, that sounds complex. It sounds like it's just one more bureaucratic thing to put in place to get in the way of getting the code out. And that is exactly what your Agile practitioners will tell you when you try and do it. But the reality is that uh, uh, we uh, see example after example after example of organizations uh, that are able to show that when they measure this and they actually address the issues when they find them, uh, that there's less rework. Uh, the software clears testing, is more reliable, more secure, uh, and they're able to prove that they can do more. They can get better quality software for less money because they're not paying for all that rework uh, at higher quality so that it's being transitioned to sustainers uh, that can do that, uh, uh, maintain the software at lower overall cost. Um, this is a, a client brief that was presented to the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense and the Software Supply Chain Risk Management Groups. Uh, they also presented at a CIS conference um, that we had here in the D.C. area uh, back in March. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a use case that we're seeing uh, briefed across a lot of government as they go through agile transformations and actually um, want to validate uh, to the stakeholders, uh, either the, uh, uh, the, the agencies with oversight for their work uh, or in stakeholders, that uh, that transformation from uh, waterfall to agile uh, actually yielded an outcome that was higher quality uh, and higher throughput. And uh, I think there's a lot of concern out there in acquisition around how you evaluate deliverables at speed. and one aspect of doing that is making sure that you evaluate the actual components and, uh, and the software that's made up in those releases. Uh, we had an event, a CISC event here in Washington um, uh, last month, and uh, there'll be another one in March as part of the object management group meetings, and we're actually looking to have a webinar uh, where some of the speakers from this last event uh, can uh, will we'll come online and, uh, and and perhaps that maybe even somebody can collaborate with NASIO on. Uh, I, I show the event not to tell you it was a great event, although I thought it was, uh, but I, I share it just so that folks in the call can got, get a sense of who actually cares about this. Um, when you look at the list of folks, you have the CIO of NSA, you've got the CIO of the Marine Corps, uh, you've got Ron Ross, who's responsible for the NIST 800 series work, you've got uh, uh, SCI, you've got DHS, and others. And, uh, and I wanted to, to make the point that uh, I think this is a conversation that's happening a lot at the federal level, and uh, uh, I think we're just sort of starting to have it at the state level, and I, and I welcome uh, your feedback and, uh, and comments on the conversation today, uh, either you know, on the call today or in follow-on meetings. Uh, I do want to close out with uh, 
uh, maybe a, a little offer, a call to action for the folks that on the call, but so that we'd extend an ASIO. It's hard to visualize what I describe sometimes without looking at something you're familiar with. And uh, uh, so we, we at CAS Software would be very comfortable working with the state to sort of give you an example of an assessment uh, on a software asset uh, that's relevant to you. And the importance of that is not necessarily the working with CAS part. The importance of that is you can associate the technical observations that we would find with all the observable observations of that system you already have, which is cost, uh, reliability, uh, user satisfaction, uh, things of that nature that you would have. So uh, we invite you to, 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 to reach out to us, and, uh, and you have an email address here. And uh, with that, Eric, I think as we get in the last uh, 15 minutes here, uh, I think we can open it up to any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Yes. This was excellent, Mark. Thank you so very much for presenting here. I've got a few starter questions while we wait to see what comes across on the chat. Uh, and please go ahead and put those uh, questions in. Uh, and as I stated earlier, I'm going to start a thread on this topic on our Enterprise Architecture and Governance uh, Committee. So there'll be a uh, uh, conversation, electronic conversation started. But let me, you know, as I looked at some of the communications you had here, uh, from GSA and DOD. Uh, GSA, uh, those communications were dated 2017. The DOD letter was dated 2012. Could you give us a sense, how far behind are, are we in state government, notwithstanding the few states that are at this, but are we 10 years behind? Are we five years behind? Uh, what do you think? No, I, so first of all, I don't think you're behind. I think okay. um, um, uh, the, the, uh, from a standards perspective, I think that, uh, oddly enough, considering how much we all spend on software, whether in our personal lives or in our government lives, uh, uh, there's never really been a standard that can be used uh, uh, that, that would be commonly agreed upon that would be a software quality standard, which is mine, which is amazing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. every state on this call has very specific requirements around uh, building codes, health codes, uh, human resource codes, for anything else that costs money, right? Uh, tax codes, you know, everything. But, but oddly enough, for the spender, has not been a consistent software standard. So these, the CIS standard really only came about, uh, and again, it's a government industry process, over the course of the last uh, year and a half, which is okay. not very long in government speak. So mm -hmm. this wave of RFPs we're seeing now, and I could share others from DHS and some other organizations, really started happening uh, in earnest in uh, uh, you know, Q4, uh, calendar Q4 of last year and coming into this year. Um, the good news is uh, there's a lot of conversation on this. Excellent. We've got a question here from Adam. If an organization is using Agile, doesn't that help solve the technical debt? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. You know, I think um, mm -hmm. um, there's a perception, I think, that by going to Agile, you've, you, you, you fix everything. And I think going to Agile... Uh, in many respects, uh, does not in any res way uh, relieve the burden on the buy side or the management side of, of, of development to make certain that what you're getting is, is uh, non-functionally what you want. Um, in Agile, there's a, the Agile folks actually brought the conversation about technical debt, which is a fairly um, old, I would say old, but 20, 15, 20-year-old 20 concept, kind of back to the forefront as a, as a metaphor for the trade-off you're going to make in a sprint right, in a sprint to get something in feature yeah. functionally, okay? Right. Uh, but unfortunately, I think what you see is that at a, at you can have technical debt accrue very quickly if there's not governance over the architecture and the non-functional attributes of that software uh, on the teams that are doing that work. And we have seen uh, 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 agile uh, teams actually accelerate technical debt as well. Um, or yeah. when you're impacted on schedule, you may not get the... Um, uh, you may not get those last waves of security or maintainability done because it has to go out the door. Yeah. We got a, a question here from Joan Redwing. Joan, welcome. Joan is a brand new chief enterprise architect for the great state of Minnesota. Glad to see you here. So Joan's asking, uh, do you have any metrics to measure technical debt in a state's application portfolio? So it's looking across, you know, uh, a very broad uh, inventory here. Right. Uh, right. What would you, no, how would you that, answer that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we uh, do not, uh, either within CISC uh, or within CAST, have uh, a database dedicated to state data so you can get a sense of uh, uh, you know, what, what that measure looks like. Now, that said, um, uh, there are uh, tools out there, um, and we have one of them called Highlight, but there are others, um, that can be used to uh, rapidly assess uh, a portfolio uh, for technical quality. Um, you know, I think that, that that looks a lot more at code patterns, but it gives you an indication of what the technical debt uh, is at a portfolio level. Um, what we were discussing in this conversation is a bit more the next level down. So I think it's moving from the portfolio to the development side of the house. Okay, now we identify these outliers. Uh, you know, what, what, can we, what can we do with it? But we don't have any um, – uh, we do have a, a, a reference database called AppMark that has a couple of billion lines of code assessment of data in it that can be used for some comparative analytics. So if you measure, if you sample a few of your systems and you want to see how you do against all things written in Oracle or all things written in COBOL uh, or break that up by industry, maybe you want to compare something in your revenue group with a, a financial services organization, uh, we can provide some comparisons so you can kind of see you know, how that might compare. Um, but, uh, but we don't have any sort of uh, a reference benchmark of, of state technical debt that, that's available now. Okay. Now, how soon in future do you think, or is it already happening, could we expect to see internal auditors uh, referencing CISC standards and actually evaluating software, possibly to uh, maybe assess risk? Right. Uh, when do you see that happening? Mark? Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we've been speaking to a couple of, uh, of, of folks uh, that are NACIO members, actually, but on the industry side that do IV and V work. And, uh -huh. uh, and they're seeing uh, that there's a lot of interest uh, to expand independent verification, not just to verify cost schedule and making certain that the functionality contracted for is in, but looking for the non-functional non attributes of the software as well. And uh, um, I don't have the liberty yet to reference those folks, but I think we'll make them known pretty soon. Um, but mm -hmm. there are, there, there's a lot of interest there. The FFRDCs in federal uh, have been doing this for quite a while. So MITRE um, uh, in the mm -hmm. Software Engineering sure. Institute uh, certainly come into big programs of record, primarily DOD, but in the healthcare side as well, uh, and, and perform uh, pretty rigorous audits. And they've all added mm -hmm. uh, automated measures uh, to their arsenal. Yeah, I think we should have a conversation with that community of auditors uh, to get their reaction, make sure this is on their radar, because I think there's going to be a time when states and corporations and others are going to ask for that service from, their, uh, from internal auditors as well as independent auditors coming in and doing system audits. That's right. You? And I think it's a very uh, easy thing to add to mm -hmm. an independent verification and validation contract. Uh, yeah. I think... It's not being done right now because it's simple. I think the acquisition folks that write those contracts just don't know uh, that there's, there's, this is available and it's got precedence in prior performance. But it can, mm -hmm. it's a very fundamental thing to add. We're starting to see it uh, being added here uh, as well. Okay. Uh, here when I say might, here, I'm in Washington, D.C., I'm sorry. Might you see or do you already see this? You mentioned SAP doing quality checks on ABOP uh, programs, that type of thing. Uh, is SAP actually coming in and saying, here is our score, you know, going back to those metrics you showed on a previous slide, or are other ERPs, you know, providers of ERPs or HR systems uh, coming in and saying, hey, here is our CISC score, right. and, you know, maybe so, they haven't because it wouldn't mean anything yet, but as people yeah. become more aware of this whole concept, they'll be asking for that. Well, where are you on the CISC scale for these various... I think dimension. that's a very valid question. I, I can't speak for, uh, you know, let's call it, I mean, the, the, the major tier one providers of package software. I think um, uh, uh, I, would, I would posit that internally they are probably considering this very closely, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think how they might communicate that uh, with their clients uh, is a very different conversation. Um, uh, that said, I think the world that, uh, and, and it's interesting, I don't want to be glib on this topic, but I've spoken to CIOs and some pretty big fortune companies 
you know, that they're one customer in a universe of many with, the, with yeah. a lot of these organizations. They don't have that much influence. Uh, but where you do have a lot of influence is in, uh, is in dealing, is making certain that all the open source software that you bring in, and that includes frameworks and all the stuff that's being assembled in your applications, all the custom code that you bring in, even if it's integration code between different COTS packages, you have a lot of control over those attributes. And, and maybe, um, not to the, not the shine too bright a light on it, you, you might have more authority over smaller vendors that are looking to differentiate themselves by demonstrating how high quality their code is. You know, mm -hmm. what we're seeing, NIST has put out a lot of risk management frameworks. And the 853 series, you know, talks about uh, how you manage that. And I was on a panel with Ron Ross, who is the lead of that, that group. And, and one of the attributes, one of the attributes, right, is, uh, is uh, having some kind of conformance measurement for, for the software from a security perspective and a reliability perspective. Uh, but, of course, there's many other attributes for deciding a vendor than that. I don't pretend that not be the case. But, uh, but we're, st we're seeing that conversation more and more. So you know, now if you go to the American Bankers Association website, you see they point to the NIST 853 as the risk management framework standard. And, uh, and, and so what CISC seeks to be uh, is to say, okay, well, whenever that word software risk comes up or looking at software, we want to be, you know, this reference that you can use, and then vendors like CAST and Synopsys and others can then provide a market, <clears throat> you know, to offer those kind of tools. Okay, very good. Uh, looking for more questions. We've got a little, few more minutes here, folks, so please put your questions in. I'll keep going here with my own questions. But, for instance, uh, as you look at uh, uh, the uh, proliferation maybe of uh, – uh, this uh, just the the awareness of this uh, set of standards and these concepts could this affect cyber insurance? Could this affect you know uh, uh, a very you know, good the, question? A very good and and I just want to assure the attendees on the call that uh, Eric and I have not rehearsed any of these questions. <laughs> That's a very good one. Um, I had an integrator come to me uh, and tell me that uh, one of the one of their highest rising costs in doing business with states is bonds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if they have a, a fixed cost contract, they need, there's a bond they have to get, a performance bond, right? I think you folks know all about that. Well, those bonds are rising because of risk that can be tied to uh, cyber. And, and that risk is growing. And, and I think the cyber folks are looking to make sure that organizations that they're going to issue those bonds for uh, are keeping their, their development and delivery practices up with current best practice, whatever that is. And I think what we're seeing now is that the, what is it you're measuring? Are you looking at these assets? Are you vetting these assets before you provide mm -hmm. them to your customer? Uh, that's a question that's being asked. And if it's answered properly, uh, I am told, I, I've not seen this, this is third-hand information, but it's, we work pretty close with these folks, that that's impacted the rates which means that it impacts your cost. And I think right. uh, uh, so it, it's a very dynamic conversation right now in that area. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd expect so. So then uh, another uh, way to look at this uh, as we, uh, you know, consider more and more knowledge uh, about uh, applying these concepts, some of the, the points that have been made by you and also a, a paper that you had sent me uh, from uh, – from CISC, and I will uh, be pump putting those up on our web. Uh, right. I, think I think this paper is from Dr. Soli. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Yep. Richard Mark Soli. Uh, they bring up, as, as well as you did, uh, this concept of layering. You know, you've got system-level risk. You've got technology-level risk. You've got code-level risk. Now, the code-level risk was sort of downplayed by Dr. Soli, and you brought up the same point that that's not the major place. But that doesn't mean you don't address it, right? That's right. That's exactly right. So, you know, the, what we see uh, is that a lot of the code level checks have a bigger impact on maintainability uh, than they do on risks like security, uh, performance efficiency, right? So how well mm -hmm. a platform performs at runtime to satisfy your requirements and robustness or resiliency. Uh, those, uh, uh, the unit, the, so a lot of the stuff that those code level checkers look for have to do with what's called code hygiene. So mm -hmm. 
it's important, and you want your code to be good. And you, it's just like when you create a Word document, you want your grammar to be, you know, you fix all the squiggly lines, right? And mm -hmm. well, when you're writing code, an ed a developer is basically has a Word, a, a, a Word, so a Microsoft Word software, but for that language. So they have, uh, you know, an editor, right? That's why they call it that. Well, when they have a file open, it's just like having a Word document open. So they'll, they'll address all those syntax issues and look and make sure that all the punctuation's are right, which is all very important for code to compile and all those things. But then they'll save that file, and that gets checked into a source control system or a build manager. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nothing is looking to see what the impact of inserting that one-page document is into the whole book. And that is where a lot of things happen, because there's unintended consequences. So yeah. you might have a very common security vulnerability is called SQL injection. Well, that, the idea is that in some interface above the database, you're making SQL calls directly to the database. That's bad. Mm -hmm. Well, the code checkers don't find that, because if you're in a, working in JavaScript, which I think a lot of folks are using Angular JS right now, very nice tool for creating great interfaces. Uh, it doesn't look for SQL. It doesn't know anything about it, so it'll skip right past that. That's just a simple example, but that's one that we see often, often, often. So you have to look at the whole code stack because it's. And again, you're, you know, when you deploy something in your production environment, whether you're a state or whether you're General Motors or AT and T, uh, it's statistically improbable that there's another instance exactly like whatever you're putting out there anywhere else on the planet because you've made it your own somehow. And so it needs to be verified uniquely for what it is, which is a unique software asset uh, that, that has to be evaluated. Mark, we're at the top of the hour, but I do want to ask you one more question. And uh, I don't see any of those others coming through yet, but we may get more questions on our thread on our community when we get started with that. And thank you for committing to help, help us with, uh, with that ongoing discussion. But here's a question. Okay, so relative to Agile teams, and we're – Big on Agile here at NASIO. Mm -hmm. Might we see in future uh, Scrum Masters actually uh, earning capabilities in CISC? Are there certifications that may be crossing over or participating in other certifications, actually adding capabilities to the to Scrum Masters? That's a, that's, that's a very good question. So um, if Dr. Curtis, who's the SIS director, were on the call, uh, he would say, uh, we call him Tex. He's from Texas. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. You know, that is exactly the thing we're working on right now. And okay. uh, because I think as folks become aware of these uh, standards, um, you want, they want to be able to be certified in those standards. And we're also seeing uh, some trailblazing system integrators, uh, you know, promulgating these standards across their own personnel globally. Um, mm -hmm. And again, a couple of those folks are NASIO members as well. So I think if you have that conversation with some of those folks, you'll, you'll get some feedback as well. I think we'll arrange for that, Mark, with your help, okay? Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for being here. Stay with us on future calls on other topics and pipe in with <laughs> some more reminders that, you know, we've got these additional standards that we need to be thinking about. And then we'll look forward to hearing from you again. We're going to be working on getting... <clears throat> presentations from North Carolina and Texas with Mark's help. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. We'll go ahead, close this call, and we wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.